Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And then Dr. Paul will get up, and he will speak for a little while, and then we'd like to turn it over to a question and answer period. We would appreciate it if you'd use the floor mic, which uh, <laughs> has been provided for us by James. Uh, that way we can get everything on tape. So if you all will, please help me welcome Max from California. Thank you. Uh, my name is Max, and I'm a happy member of Al-Anon. I, I want to tell you, I know expert at this thing, and I don't do it all the time, <laughs> but there have been a few things that we've learned uh, on the program that work, at least for us. In the beginning, uh, I used to try to get Paul to talk, and it was always a fiasco. Uh, he didn't want to talk, and he didn't like to hear what I had to say, and so finally, before we came to the program, I had given up. So when he started going to AA and I was going with him, um, we would ride from Anaheim down to Laguna Beach, which took about 35, 40 minutes. And for the first time in my life, I was able to be in the car with Paul and not talk. Because before, I used to ask him questions, which made him mad. And I, I never could understand why. But anyway, uh, and then we would we'd go to speaker meetings, and on the way home, we'd talk about what the speaker said. And that's the way our communication started. After we were around about two years, I think, uh, we were able to tell each other how we felt rather than what we thought. Where before, I felt, I felt I was always right. So if I could explain it to Paul well enough, he would agree with me. Well, that never happened, and I don't expect it to happen. And, but today it's okay. I, I give him the right to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, I, maybe we all come in that way feeling that, because I always thought of myself as a very logical person, and I had proof because I had had my handwriting analyzed, and the woman told me that. She said that I was very logical, and I figured everything out, and then once I figured it out, that's the way it was. And I thought, gee, isn't that wonderful? That's just exactly the way I am. And I couldn't wait to go home and tell Paul and he listened to me, and he said, uh, well, she can call it logic if she wants to, but I call it bullheadedness. <laughs> so I guess it's just a matter of perspective. But uh, I remember the first time that I was able to tell Paul how I felt, which was kind of difficult for me because I didn't know how I felt when I came to the program, and I didn't know for three years how I felt. If you had asked me if I knew, I would have said, of course I do. But I really didn't, and I, I know I was at an al meeting one night, and it suddenly dawned on me that I really didn't know how I felt about many, many things. And uh, so the first thing that happened was the awareness that I didn't know, and then the second hurdle I had was to try to figure out what I was feeling and how to express it. And that was very difficult, and, and it's hard to uh, to be able to pinpoint, because with me, I had covered it up with so many other things that I, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know what the real emotion was. And sometimes I'd have to say to myself, what was the first, what was the first reaction I had when this happened? And then sometimes I could pinpoint uh, the um, feeling. And I know the first time we, Paul and I had a lot of problems with our older daughter, and um I felt that she was able to manipulate us because of the things she did, and then Paul always blamed me for everything that happened. And um, so I said to him, you know, I feel like I'm a puppet, and Anne is pulling the strings, and I'm dancing. And he said, that's not true. And I said, I don't care if it's true or not. That's the way I feel. And that's the way I did feel. And so that was uh, an opening, and I, I really think that was one of our big breakthroughs 
on the program when we were able to do that. Like I say, I don't always do it. Even today, I don't always do it. I don't know what the reason is, whether I'm afraid of what his reaction is going to be if I say things. But I, we went made a marriage encounter uh, early in, in uh, sobriety, and they said, if you say, I feel that, that it's not a feeling. You have to say, I feel. Um, but uh, that, that's been a great thing, at least for us. Um, other things have happened um, uh, to make us to be able to at least have a conversation. I bought a book. Not, maybe some of you have read it. I haven't read it. I bought the book for the title. And it's Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. <laughs> and Paul and I are very different. I mean, we don't think the same. Uh, our reactions are not the same. And today it's okay. But there was a long time when I felt that I had to convince him to think like I did. And I think I have surrendered <laughs> in that respect. It's better to say, what is it? It's better to say nothing to, than to say something bad about someone. Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, I should have brought notes, I guess. <laughs> I uh, I learned a lot about myself by going to Al-Anon meetings. I learned a lot about myself by going to AA meetings because I don't think there's too much difference between us. I'm I'm as obsessive as any alcoholic. Uh, I was telling uh, Helen uh, during lunch that um, I when I first came, I was going to all these psychiatrists, and then I would do what they thought and. Um, this one psychiatrist asked me if I had hobbies. And I, hobbies? I don't have any hobbies. All I do is work and come home and go to bed or wait to go to bed. And uh, so I heard some woman talking about uh, that she had a knitting machine. Now, I don't even know how to knit by hand, but I went out and bought the biggest knitting machine I could find. And I got ten free lessons, and I never did learn to use that dumb thing. Uh, and finally, Paul says, you either get rid of that or I'm going to throw it out. So I sold it. I advertised it as a penny saver. And then the next thing was that uh, I always wanted to play the organ. So I bought an organ, and I got ten free lessons. And uh, I never did learn to play the organ. Well, one of the things wrong with that was my younger daughter played the piano, and she could play the organ very well. And there was no way I was going to practice in front of her. And then the last thing was that a friend of mine was taking painting lessons, and I had always liked to draw as a child, so I did that, and that I loved, because I, during, it saved my life, I think, during the drinking, because we didn't do anything except stay home, and I would watch Paul, and I think he watched me, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> uh, anyway, I would go to this woman's garage every Tuesday, and that was my lifesaver, because when I was mixing paint and painting, I didn't think of anything else. And I still am painting. Oh, now I'm into China painting. But I'm very obsessive about that. And I have to, I have to watch myself because if I see something that someone else is doing, I think, ooh, that's interesting. And I think, no, 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 don't do that because I've got needlepoint canvases. I've got all kinds of things that I started and then I would find something else and uh, be interested in that. So I'm trying to stick with one one hobby at a time. And, uh, and I, you know, I grew up in an alcoholic home, and uh, I don't I don't really think there's that much difference between the non-alcoholic and the alcoholic who lives with alcoholics. Uh, I grew up in a family where there's alcoholism, and that's all I saw. And then married Paul, and he claims he wasn't an alcoholic when he married me, and it's all my fault. But um, anyway, you just I guess you just get used to thinking that way. I don't know. Um, but okay, it's okay. I, uh, people say to me, uh, Are you, uh, you're on the wrong program, and I say, well, I'm not going to give up my seniority to come over <laughs> to AA and start as a newcomer again. Um, uh, but uh, today, uh, we pretty much let each other alone and don't try to convince the other one that they should think like we do. I, 
Like I say, Paul and I are very different. Uh, um, we we just don't, we aren't even interested. I mean, he's into computers and I could care less. And he doesn't want to paint and that's okay with me. And he doesn't want to cook and that's okay with me. I wouldn't want to clean up the mess uh, if he did. Um, I guess that's about all I have to say. I'd rather li listen to what you have to say. Thank you. here from the other side, Dr. Paul. Uh, we talked at lunch about so many different types of relationships, so I know we're going to really get a good lesson from Dr. Paul now. Help me welcome to California. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I was looking over the crowd. I was trying to find out. I've been sitting here trying to figure out why there were more people on this side of the room than on that side of the room. Now, I know that this is the, the smokers are on the right and the non-smokers are on the left. I just wondered if the smokers had less relationship problems or, uh, <laughs> if, or, or if they have more or what it is. Anyway, uh, I don't know what good that observation is. But uh, I had, I'm, along with Max, I have to apologize for us being here uh, having this panel. <laughs> We have no qualifications for this job as to be leading a panel on relationship, well, uh, except one. The only thing is we've been married for the, uh, December 2nd of this year. We will have been married 56 years. And uh, you're, you're, no, you're nowhere near as impressed as I am. It, uh, the... Uh, the uh, and uh, one of the significances of being married 56 years this year is that this is my 28th year of sobriety. I've been sober for 28 years. And uh, so that means that Max drove me to drink for 28 <laughs> years, and now I've been sober 28 years, so we're even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that means, but I know we're even now. And... Uh, so, and, and as Max said, that I uh, I wasn't an alcoholic when I married her. In fact, as she was saying this morning at her thing, she was raised by two alcoholic uncles and then lived with another uncle and uh, the, the Gensline boys. And uh, we lived in this small town. My father had this uh, drugstore, and he did. He uh, the the, the, uh, drunk, the Gensline boys were frequently in the Elias Review for having been arrested for common drunk again. And uh, as we were growing up, my family didn't like for me to be playing with the Gensline girl because they were afraid that if uh, we ever got married, that I might turn out to be an alcoholic. And by God, they were right. Uh, they, uh, I'm an alcoholic by marriage. So, uh, and, uh, and, and the truth is, we never should have gotten married. Uh, we, we always had those arguments about how we never should have gotten married in the first place. Every time we get into an argument, we start arguing about divorce. And who's going to get the divorce and whether or not we should get a divorce. And we always come to the conclusion we never should have gotten married in the first place. And until finally I got so sick of talking about divorce, I said, I'm not going to. We, we argue about divorce instead of arguing about the thing we should be trying to settle. And, uh, and neither one of us had the nerve to get the divorce. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to talk about it. I just, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk about divorce. I don't, I don't want to hear anything about divorce. I mean... If you want a divorce, you go, you see an attorney, you get the papers, and you come and you bring the papers and you say, sign here. And I'll either sign it or uh, we'll talk about it. But until then, we won't talk about divorce. And that, that, that made a big change when we stopped talking about divorce. It just I'm not saying that others shouldn't. I'm not uh, saying nobody should ever get a divorce. I'm, all I'm saying is what our experience was. And uh, when we no longer talked about divorce, we had to talk about the problem. And it also meant that if you're not going to get drunk over something and you're not going to get divorced over it, you've got to figure out some other answer to how you're going to do it. And and living with Max has been very difficult, very difficult. I mean, she's, 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 we're very different. I mean, she's she's strange, isn't she? Right? The, 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 one of the things that's in, one of the differences is that I'm a vertical thinker, and Max is a horizontal thinker. Uh, when we have a, I have a problem. I like to narrow things down and get less and less information until it comes to a point. And when it reaches a point, I know 
what I'm going to do next. I know where we go from here. Max is not a vertical thinker. She doesn't want less and less information. She always wants more. She all, no matter what it is, she always wants to ask one more question. And the, she's always looking for more information about something. And, and I, I will spend 15, 20 minutes, half hour, trying to figure out how I can ask the question so that she can only answer yes or no. <laughs> All I want to know is yes or no. We've talked about it long enough. I just all I want is yes or no. And I'll get it all figured out. And I'll ask my question. And she'll ask some other dumb question. I said, I like a, the guy that said about the Jewish, he was talking to a Jewish rabbi. I guess most rabbis are Jewish, aren't they? Uh, he was talking to this rabbi. And he says, how come, how come you Jews always answer a question by asking another question. And the rabbi said, why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 that's, and Max always wants more. And she, we're very opposite. She likes to watch television. One show at a time. And I don't like to watch television. And when I do watch it, I want to watch them all. <laughs> I, just click by. You, maybe if you watch them all at once, they'll add up to something worth watching. You know? <laughs> When I have something, I'm through with something, I want to put it away. I want to put it away where it belongs. So I know where it is. Max enjoys the hunt. She would... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, I, like, I like our things orderly. I, Max likes them, uh, uh, she, she likes spontaneity. I like things planned. She likes things to be spontaneous. Uh, I, as I say, she's very, uh, very difficult to live with him. And, and she drove me to drink, as I said, for 28 years. And yet, once I got, gave up drinking, she didn't change. She was still difficult to live with. And I used to think uh, the, uh, that, that I, somebody needed to know what it's like living with this woman and, and not drinking. And I, and, and I figured that's what, <clears throat> that's what sponsors are for, somebody to whine to. And... I would call my sponsor up, Jack, and I would I would tell him what, what she had done. And I remember one day I called him up and I said, let me tell you what she did today. And I started, started telling him, and I had, I had hardly even gotten started, <clears throat> and he interrupted me. He interrupted me, and he says, he says, why don't you put it out of your mind a couple of days and see what happens? I said... <laughs> Jack, a couple of days, I'll forget all about it. <laughs> and even when I did talk to Jack, when I did get the story out to Jack, he always ended up with the same answer. The answer was always, well, well whatever. Yeah. And I would think, whatever, what am I going to do with whatever? So, yeah. It's this business of, uh, of uh, not, drinking, uh, not drinking and not divorcing. I remember I used to answer this question, well, is it important? I'd be upset about something. And a, <clears throat> and a little voice would say to me, is, is, this, is this really that important? And my answer always was, hell yes, it's important. And I would argue with the voice and tell him how important it was. And then the voice would say, well, is it worth drinking over? I said, hell no, no, it's not worth, no, nothing, nobody is worth getting drunk over, for God's sake. And then the little voice would say, well, if you're, if you're not going to reward yourself with a drink, why bother to be so upset? Yeah. And I'd have no answer. Yeah. And so I'd have to find ways to, to uh, uh, become independent of that. In fact, that's a, a, a focus that has helped me a great deal, is to think in terms of my uh, emotional uh, sobriety. In case you wonder why I keep playing with this thing, it's because it's taped down and it's not taped very well and it keeps pulling loose. And so I keep pushing it back up and it keeps dropping down. It's like living, it's like living with Max. I mean, nothing ever works very right. well. But I, the, I have, uh, uh, the, uh, Father Barney used to come down from, uh, the Seattle area, come down to RA and put on retreats for, uh, alcoholic and all those <clears throat> until he died. I don't know what he's been doing since, but he 
he used to not only break sobriety down to a day at a time, but he broke. He said sobriety was like a uh, baseball diamond. That first base was physical sobriety, second base was mental sobriety, the third base was emotional sobriety, and home plate was spiritual sobriety. And I like that concept. And in fact, I would put uh, in marital sobriety and even financial sobriety. But uh, as far as that emotional sobriety is concerned, I, I, uh, actually, I put it in writing. I made, I wrote it out uh, to Max. I wrote a, a declaration of emotional independence. And I wrote down and said to her that from <clears throat> this day forward, she was no longer responsible for my emotional state. That if I got upset at whatever she did or whatever she failed to do, that was my choice to be upset. And it, my upsetness came from me, my, not from what she had done. And uh, I put, as I put that in writing and gave it to her, and one of the things that that did is that if she's no longer responsible for my emotional state, that means I'm not responsible for hers either. <clears throat> and as a result, <clears throat> we can't use um, emotional upsetness as blackmail. If I don't like her behavior, I can't get upset in order to force her to change her behavior. And, uh, and she can't do the other, the opposite. And also, I don't feel guilty then for how she feels. It's a, it's, it's a form of uh, release, release with love, or emotional <clears throat> detachment, as it's usually called in Al-Anon. Sometimes they call it release, sometimes they call it release with love. <clears throat> no matter what they call it, it feels like uh, rejection to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 one of the things we had to do, or I've had to do, is that uh, I'm not going to drink over it, and I'm not going to leave, then I have to find other answers. And <clears throat> so I started making, uh, looking up, uh, learning communication as a uh, hobby. And it's, uh, I, I've come to the conclusion that that's what a relationship is. A relationship is, a, is an exercise in communications. And um, one of the things I read was I was reading stuff by uh, David and Vera Mace, M-A-C-E. David and Vera, were, they were both um, marriage and MFCC, marriage, child, and family counselors. And they had been practicing their uh, profession for 50 years each. And the way they had done, done it was the first 25 years, <clears throat> they were typical uh, marriage counseling practice where they dealt with people, uh, couples who were having all kinds of problems in their relationship. And the second 25 years of that 50, they uh, were working with marriages that were doing very well, but wanted to do better. They had an organization they called uh, Marriage Enrichment. And uh, they thought, well, that's a wonderful opportunity to see what it is that makes the troubled relationships have trouble that the long-term non-troubled relationships uh, didn't have. And they looked at the uh, relationships that had fallen apart, and they found out that uh, mostly <clears throat> their problems were related to children, sex, money, in-laws. And then they looked at the relationships that were doing real well to see what problems they had, and they found out that they <clears throat> their problems were related to money, sex, kids, in-laws, the very same things. So it wasn't the problems <clears throat> that were causing the problems. It was what, it was something else. And so they went into a study of what were the differences in the two sets of relationships. <clears throat> and after a considerable period of study, they decided that the relationships that were doing well had three things that the other relationships did not have. And they decided that uh, the relationships that were doing well had one, they had a bilateral concern for your sponsor's spiritual and emotional growth. 
And two, spouse. As a matter of fact, one of the things that Max and I have done, uh, I'm not recommending this at all, but one of the things that Max and I do tend to sponsor each other. When we can see the other one getting in trouble, we can point that out. That's a very delicate thing. <laughs> I repeat, I am not recommending it. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm sharing, not advising. Uh, but if you wonder how well, Max and I stayed married so long, it's because all these years she's been following me around and correcting me when I make mistakes <laughs> like that. And, and uh, I need all the help I can get. Anyway, the first thing they decided was uh, a bilateral <clears throat> concern for their spouse's uh, spiritual and emotional growth. And the second thing was <clears throat> a bilateral uh, willingness to study and to practice communication skills. And the third was a bilateral agreement to deal with problems creatively. And I thought, geez, that's a tremendous... Uh, set of differences. How would you ever get that? But <clears throat> the more I think about it, the more it seems to me that's exactly what AA and al is, that we have an interest in each other's spiritual and emotional growth. We do learn, have to learn and practice communication skills, even if we're not thinking of it as such. But to me, <clears throat> that's what sharing in programs in, in, uh, at meetings uh, is, and we learn to do that outside the meeting. And it's... Uh, and the idea, if you, if you can't drink or leave, and you decide not to leave, you're going to have, have to f uh, find other ways of dealing with your problem. Uh, for instance, um, one of the things that's been one of my favorite lines in the book, in the big book of AA, is a line that, uh, the same line is in two places. <clears throat> one of them is in italics. You almost think they were trying to stress it. Uh, and it says, we cease fighting everything and everybody. And so that uh, I find that if I'm fighting Max, I'm not working by program. <clears throat> I'm having trouble with my voice because <clears throat> the smoke's getting to me. But uh, <clears throat> the, the, another line that's in the book that's along that one, on page 132, it says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. That's part of our program. It's after the steps. We absolutely insist on enjoying life, which means to me, if I'm not enjoying life, if I'm not enjoying my sobriety, there's something wrong with my program. If I'm not enjoying my relationship, there's something wrong with my program. There's something I'm not doing or doing wrong. And which brings up another line that's in the 12 and 12. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks very much. This an Alamon lady gave me a mint. <laughs> the, uh, why didn't you unwrap it for me? I can't get the paper. Because she's not an Alamon. <laughs> uh, another line that's in the book, and I think it is bears very much on relationships, it's in the uh, 12 and 12. And it says that it is a spiritual axiom that whenever we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there is something the matter with us. Now, I don't, I interpret that not to mean that we're always wrong, but that if we are upset, <clears throat> there's something wrong, there's something fixable in us. There's something we can do about us. It's our responsible, responsibility to be aware of our emotional state and to do something about it which goes back to the beginning when Max and I came into sobriety, her efforts were all spent on trying to change me. And my efforts were all spent on trying to change her. That's how she drove me to drink. I was always trying to change her, and she wouldn't change. It was very difficult. And she was trying to change me. And I understand from my uh, friends who do uh, counseling and that, that that's typical that almost all people who come into uh, uh, counseling, marriage counseling, each one is always trying to change their spouse. People don't come in and say, well, you changed me so my spouse gets along better with me. They all want the other spouse to change. 
<clears throat> in the program, we've learned we have to work on each other, on ourselves, I mean, not on each other. And as a matter of fact, this being a workshop and not in a, uh, an AA meeting, I can bring up something else. I have some uh, a pamph a pamphlet here. And I brought a few samples, and you can pick them up afterwards if you're interested. But it's how to. I found them in uh, <clears throat> questions in Texas, and they're how to study the first 164 pages of the big book. And when you come to a step, you do the step. It's not a step study. It's a step do it. And it works best if you make up a group. And so, <clears throat> so if you are interested in setting up a group, to study the first 164 pages of the book and do the steps as you come to them, I'll send you all the um, uh, pamphlets you want. They're free, and you just make a donation. It's so much the book, I wouldn't think of selling them, but uh, because it's just it'd be selling the program. Um, anyhow, I um, we pretty much taken <clears throat> responsibility for our old behavior, and I <clears throat> I've pretty much come to the conclusion. I said repeatedly that Max drove me to drink and the trouble we have getting along together. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it has helped me to uh, believe that it's true. And I've made and it's a decision that I've made. I've decided that people treat me the way I have taught them to treat me. If I don't like the way somebody is treating me, it's because I've taught them to do it. I've taught them. That that's what I'll tolerate. That's what I'll put up with. That's what I expect of them. And if I don't like it, it's up to me to change it. And I like that because it empowers me to do something about my relationship, to take responsibility for them, and then things to do to make it better. And um, we've done, and done a lot of things of uh, that type. Um, another thing that has helped me is in the program to uh, learn new definitions of love. <clears throat> to me, uh, saying I love you, I love you, I love you, was kind of a meaningless term because it, uh, I've even had people you know, come up to me and say, I love you. And I think, what, what am I supposed to say to that? Or what, what do you really mean by that? And uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm, I've just been kind of uncomfortable with the un I love you as the only expression of love. And I, um, in the program, I've heard other definitions of love. I remember uh, Don G. used to say, love is an active concern for another person's welfare. An active concern for that person's welfare. <clears throat> I remember one night, I called Chuck C. up, and I said, what's your definition of love? And he says, it's the same thing at 11 o'clock in the morning as it is 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> oh, that's, God, he's a crabby old fool. Uh, I said, yeah, but what is it? And he says, it's action. Bang, he hung up. And love is action. And um, I remember the time that I went to, um, we went to a marriage encounter weekend. And it was, the motto was, love is a decision. And I don't know if they said it or whether I modified it into, love is a daily decision. I mean, my, my love for Max is not so much a feeling, it is that too, but it's a decision. If I decide to have an active concern for her welfare, if I'm will, in fact, I heard the definition that love, love is making the other person feel important. Now, if I decide to make her feel important, that's a decision, and then I take the actions to show her that I think she's important. And I've done a number of things <clears throat> purposely on that. I really spoiled her rotten, as a matter of fact. Uh, Yes, indeed. I, I said, boy, she loves to have her back scratched. I scratch her back every morning and every night, 365 days a year. <laughs> oh, 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 you're so. <laughs> they, they, and at night, 
at night until she decided she was getting overweight and he didn't want me to do it anymore. I used to make her uh, every night a chocolate sundae with butter pecan ice cream and nuts and whipped cream. <laughs> Not only that, this is, this is one. I used to make her. She likes to wake up to a hot... She hates to wake up. Uh, but when she does wake up, she likes to wake up to a, a hot cup of coffee at her... Oh, that's not true. She doesn't, she doesn't like hot, hot coffee. And she hates cold, hot coffee. Well, what she likes <clears throat> is hot coffee with two ice cubes that haven't melted yet. Okay. Well, that's not asking too much because if the, if the ice cubes have melted, then she doesn't know whether they're there or not. She wakes up to a problem. <laughs> Did you put the ice cubes in this coffee? <laughs> so, I get up before Max does. In fact, the whole world gets up before Max does. <laughs> and I take care of Lily and Sabrina, our two Allen dogs. And I decided it's time for Max about to wake up. So I go to make her coffee. She doesn't like brewed coffee. She doesn't even like the taste of coffee, as a matter of fact. And she, she, she likes instant coffee. Any instant coffee, <clears throat> as long as it's you, man. And, and she, uh, a level teaspoon. Don't make it too strong. Level teaspoon. And, and you put them in And you don't, you don't boil the water. You take the water out of a hot water dispenser. Hot water dispenser, there's this spigot over here, and the hose goes down under the sink, and there's a tank under there. <clears throat> you have to hire a man <laughs> to install it. He, he has to drill a hole about that big, <laughs> drill a hole in, that, in the stainless steel sink, and replace the perfectly good white porcelain sink that was there. <laughs> But the hot water dispenser dispenses water at just the right temperature for putting two ice cubes in it. And, and you have the uh, U-Ban in the bottom of the cup and then lots of cream. Not, 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 hates milk, doesn't like liquid cream, likes uh, powder. Cream more, cream more. Lots, a tablespoonful, a little more than a tablespoon. As I said, she doesn't like to taste coffee. She likes, she likes a little coffee flavor with her hot milk. And, uh, and, and you put that in the bottom cup, and then you run the water in, and you swirl it around as it's running in. She doesn't like it if it's cakes at the bottom of the cup. <laughs> and you have to keep the spoon dry because she might bite one another cup. And you swish it around, and you don't want to swish it too hard, or it'll go over the side, and then make the bottom of the cup wet. And, that's okay. and, and you don't want it too full either, because uh, you've got to slide two ice cubes in them. You, you have to slide them in. You don't drop them in. They're going to go all over the bottom of the cup will be wet. And that's no good. And, and you have to leave room, too, so that you drop, slide in the true ice cube. And then you put in the, then you top it off with whipped cream. And then you add a sprinkle of cinnamon powder. And then you walk <coughs> into the crowded, the darkened bedroom. You have to be careful where you walk. Because if you, in your bare feet, if you step on those high-heeled shoes, it's painful. And, and you want to be really careful walking beside the bed because those uh, glossy magazines are real slippery. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when you get to the bedside stand, you don't look for a bare spot. You just look for a level spot. <laughs> <coughs> Then you set the ice cream, you set the coffee down, and you, now this is all the easy part. Yeah. Uh, you, you, the hard part is you have to walk out, and you don't do anything to accidentally wake her up. You hope she will wake up before the ice cream smell. Now that, that even that, that's all the the easy part. The hard part, is, the really hard part is, you can't expect her to appreciate it. Because if you expect her to appreciate it, it's not love, it's barter. 
That's what Chuck C. used to always say. Love is for free and for fun. For free and for fun. If you expect anything in return, even appreciation, it's not love, it's barter. Pretty strict rule, it seemed to me. Uh, but I, I can't I can't complain. Max has been very cooperative. Max, has, I've never known her to appreciate it. So, to, uh, to me, that's love. Now, uh, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, I want to learn from you guys. Um, why don't you start asking questions or making comments? There's no question that's too difficult. That uh, <coughs> we can either say, hell, I don't know. Or, or we will turn it to somebody in the audience who will have an answer to any question. And if you're too embarrassed to um, come up to the microphone, just stand up and shout it out, and we'll repeat the question from up here so it'll be taped that way. And um, as a matter of fact, in the, in the room, how many people in this room are in a relationship? Did you raise your hand? Yeah, that's good. Very good. How many wish they were in a relationship? How many wish they weren't in a relationship? <laughs> Okay, who's got the first question? Comment, statement. If you love us, you'll stand up and uh, answer, ask a question. Stand up right where you are and state your question or your comment. One thing that Max and I have had to decide is that it's a definite rule in our house that whoever goes crazy first, it's their turn. You, you, the point being, you can't go crazy when the other person's already crazy. You can't stand to have both the crazy at the same time. So whoever gets there first, it's their turn. And it saves a lot of trouble if we don't go crazy at the same time. The uh, Another thing that happens to us is that we don't say angry as long as we used to. We still have differences, we'll still get upset, but uh, in a very short time later we can act like nothing happened and move on. We don't, we don't have to punish the other person as well <coughs> from, as we used to. Way back there. Could, does Max ever wake up when I bring the coffee in? Yeah. Very seldom. <laughs> she, she, yes, no, it's, uh, it's pretty well time that uh, I can kind of tell when she's going to wake up. And uh, uh, well, lately, though, it has a couple of times that I've heard you call in and say, "Have you made my coffee yet?" I mean, that's see, that's the that's the risk at doing something nice for somebody. If, if, if you do it more than twice, it becomes your job, you know. <laughs> and then you have to do it, and uh, so that has happened. Yes, right here. Uh, we don't have a, a, the question was how do we bring up the topics we want to discuss? Do we have a regular scheduled time? Uh, I don't think we have a regular scheduled time, and sometimes I'll have to think and think and think about when we're going to bring it up to try to bring it up at the right time. And if it isn't, the, if it doesn't seem like the right time for the other person, they have the right to say I'd rather not talk about it now, but set up a time of when we will. One of the things we've established in the last uh, few months. Uh, is uh, Tuesday night is date night. We always go out together on Tuesday night, and we eat out and usually go to a movie or something like that. So we do have that time together. And uh, all our friends have gotten aware of that now, that uh, Monday noon is the Al-Anon meeting. We're not home at that time. Uh, Tuesday night is date night. There's no use calling. Wednesday night and Thursday night are two home group nights. <clears throat> if there's uh, no use calling, then we won't be home. And... Uh, the weekends, I'm either home or not, but Tuesday night is always. <laughs> Tuesday night is not. Uh, there was, I had another profound thought on that, uh, but I lost it. It's your loss. Uh, I'll, I'll think of it later. Uh, 
Do you have any thoughts on that? Everybody's worried about the young man over there. <laughs> Good. Complicated question. Okay. Um, let's Let see. I've been married for about a year. I was sober when I met my wife, and I've been sober since we were married. And uh, every time I come to places like this, well, she's wearing an al sticker right now. They say, is this your Al-Anon? Well, she's my wife. I introduced her. This is my wife. Or is this my wife or my Al-Anon? Um, you know, just because she's my wife, does that make her an Al-Anon? But what do you do? It's kind of an awkward social situation here. I, I want to introduce her as my wife. Oh, she's your Al-Anon. Or, you know, uh, how does one, one deal with I'll such a thing? I'll answer that one. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think you can be an Al-Anon if you don't go to Al-Anon meetings any more than you could be a member of AA if you didn't go to meetings. I, I would say she's missing a good bet if she doesn't go. Really. I, I, my life has changed completely because of al -Anon. So I wish she'd give it a try. Find a good, go to six or seven different meetings till you find the one you feel comfortable in. It works. Um, the point though that you are married to somebody that you wish would go to Al-Anon but doesn't go. In my experience is one of the worst things you can do is tell her she ought to go. I mean, because coming from you, even if it's a good idea, it becomes a bad idea. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, any more than it was, did anybody ever, did you ever quit drinking because somebody said you ought to? You know, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work either direction. I mean, we, uh, Chuck C. used to say, we can't hear until we can hear, and we can't see until we can see. And so that you're telling her isn't going to do it. The best uh, thing you can do is set an example. If you work a fantastic program, and have a tremendous change of personality, and just Mr. Winner all through and through, and she wants what you've got, and the only way she can get it is to go to meetings, then she may go, but I doubt if she'll go because you tell her she ought to. And for God's sake, don't tell her she ought to go because she's sick. It's, <laughs> even if you think she is. My name's Herman Key, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, uh, I ain't got no question, I don't believe. I, I believe, though, you went overboard with that, that coffee business. <laughs> uh, my wife ain't here, and I'm glad she ain't getting you too. Uh, that would set her afire. Uh, we have had a good relationship, a long relationship. I've been married 68 years to the same woman. I'll drink to that. Uh, I married March 22nd, 1927. I was born October the 18th, 1906. So that makes me 69 years, uh, 89 years old. <laughs> I'm a little confused. And I've been sober 41 years. I've had some good relationships. I've had some just sort of good relationships, and I've had some bad ones. Back in my drinking days, uh, my wife is a late sleeper ordinarily. Uh, she never would. Uh, I could. I get up and uh, eat breakfast. Now we would have tired, but uh, long when I was a drinking. I was pretty bad to go out at night and stay pretty late. And uh, I say she was a real late sleeper always. And uh, but on them occasions, usually it'd be Saturday night, uh, she'd get up real early, about daylight, and cook breakfast. I'd be sick, you know, feel bad, and uh, she'd call me in, but. 
And she'd start that uh, asking questions, and uh, I really didn't want to uh, do it. It was just a regular question there, you know. What time did you get in last night? Well, it wasn't late. <laughs> Who was you with? Well, I'd tell her. I'd lie to her. I'd tell her somebody, you know. Where did you go? Oh, such silly questions as that, and really, I didn't know myself uh, where, I, where all I'd been, but that was getting under my skin, and I'd just cuss her out and go off and get drunk again. Now, I'm ashamed of that, but that's the truth. That's just about the way it went. Uh, but uh, I got all the, uh, I, I think at AA and Al-Anon, uh, it's real good, and I'm sort of like Max. I think that they ought to get a little bit of both of it. I ought to get a little of al and my wife does. She likes to go to AA. And uh, it's meant an awful lot to me and my wife. Uh, and staying together, in fact, is the business. That's how I come me to come to AA to sort of save my family. I was about to lose my wife, and I was about to lose my job. And, and my boss told me that I was going to have to come to AA, and she was right in part, you know, if it would do anything to keep me from drinking, well, she didn't rock the boat a bit. She recommended it. And I've been in AA a long time, and I, I can't say enough of good things about AA. I recommend it to anybody that's got a drinking problem to think. Thank you, Herman. Uh, along the line of... Uh, she going down on you going to AA. Uh, Elsa C., Chuck C.'s wife, used to say that when you had the two like that, it was like two railroad tracks, separately but together, both going in the same direction. And all those meetings has ties holding them together so that it's a, it's a great way to go, like you say. Hey, thank you. Yes. Hi. I'm Dixie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm just in awe at your relationship and how long you've been married and that's just wonderful and and I want a relationship like that I want one where I can you know live with somebody forever grow old with and die with have somebody right there with me for my whole life I've been in several relationships and it seems like in the beginning there's always an infatuation period where you're like just real high and oh he's so wonderful and you know and and um, what I want to know is how do you maintain that, or can you maintain that? And you mentioned a while ago about the Tuesday night dates that y'all have each week. And has that been something that you've done your whole marriage? Did, and do you grow deeper and deeper in love with each other as the years pass, or how do, how do you how do you get there? <laughs> That's what I want. How do I get it? That's an easy one. <laughs> Well, I don't know, but one of the things I heard when I came to al was that you can't change the past, so you might as well forget it and go on. And that's helped me a lot, because if, if you're resentful about something, especially if you've been married for a while, uh, it doesn't do any good to be resentful, and you only hurt yourself. But if you're not married, I don't know how to do that. I don't know, because we've been married forever. We've known each other forever. We've known each other since we were four years old. We lived next door to each other. Um, so I don't know how to tell you to get somebody like that, but... <laughs> you want to answer? One of the things, I, I didn't wasn't thinking in terms of uh, how you make a relationship get better and better, but my experience is <clears throat> that my disease, my alcoholism, was very progressive. But so is recovery. The longer I'm in recovery, the better life gets. And <clears throat> as a result of that, this is the best our marriage has ever been. And no, it, it was only a matter of uh, months or a year that we decided to have a Tuesday night, date night. That isn't something that's gone all along. We're always thinking up new things. That idea of love being a daily decision is important to me. That means I re-decide it on a daily basis. And when I find I'm not doing well in the relationship, uh, I can re-decide what I want it to be. 
and work on it that. And I, we don't keep reliving the past, but just on, in the, the present. Uh, as far as uh, doing it on a long-term basis, I, I had no intentions ever of being married this long. I didn't even plan on living this long. I just didn't, I didn't plan on being sober this long. I just didn't plan on dying, that's all. And if you don't die, you don't drink, you don't divorce, it happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Michael. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. Um, if two alcoholics are in a relationship, whether they're married or just living together, should they go to Al-Anon as well as Alcoholics Anonymous? Max is nodding yes. You know, yeah, Max nodded yes. And it, it's almost, I feel almost as if maybe I had uh, prompted you to ask that question. Uh, because it, it's one of the most common problems I run into in people I work with or people that ask me for help. One of the most common problems is an alcoholic going crazy in a relationship with another alcoholic. And I'll listen to their story and let them tell the whole thing and I'll say, well, that is, that's a 100% Al-Anon problem. Why don't you go to Al-Anon? And you know what they do? They're insulted. They're insulted. Me? I'm an alcoholic. You know, why would I go to Al-Anon? You know, and I've come to the conclusion that AA is the only place in the world where you will find people who think that being an alcoholic makes you more of a person than if you're a non-alcoholic. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the evidence of that is that an Al-Anon person will, after one, two, three, five, ten years, an Al-Anon will decide they're alcoholic and go to AA, which is perfectly all right, but then they look down on the Al-Anons and make fun of the Al-Anons. And I, I find that so inconsistent with our program, where we're based on uh, mutual understanding and humility. Humility is one of the major parts of the AA program, and yet we lose it when we talk about... And I used to tell Al-Anon jokes, because they're, they're so easy to make fun of. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, they're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. Uh, but I've decided that al jokes are like ethnic jokes. I mean, there's nobody either as individuals or as an organization that are more anxious to see us stay sober and make it than in al -Anon. And, and And the truth is... And, and I sincerely believe, I sincerely believe that alcoholics who are in a, in a relationship with a non-alcoholic uh, definitely are cheating themselves if they don't go to Alamo. Yes, sir. My name is James, and I'm an alcoholic. The only thing I know about relationships is what not to do. I don't know the things about what to do. I'm one of them people that really not in a relationship. Uh, but when Dixie came up here and expressed a feeling about wanting to grow old with somebody and how her desire was like that, I feel that every human being has that feeling and because I believe we're made that way. We all want that. How to find it? I'm learning. I'm practicing something because of what, what, today what I know about it is what somebody else told me. The only thing I know that's been of value since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous is something I heard from somebody else. And what I'm doing today with, with experimenting with relationships is trying to practice something somebody told me from one of those podiums. said, if you want the lady that you're with to be a princess or a queen, if you treat her like one, she will be. And what my experience has been with practicing that is that I'm still a runner. And what happens when I practice that is it works too well for me, and I get scared and run again. And so maybe it would work the other way around, too, if the lady would want the man that she's with to be a king or a prince if she treats him like one, he will be. And I think that's what's going on with Herman's relationship and yours and my parents and and uh, my grandparents and people that I've admired through my life that were able to do that. And I failed miserably, miserably with three marriages and one uh, live-in experience because I wanted to do it my way. And, and I kept going on those guilt trips from what those preachers said behind the podium about what God puts together, let no man rip asunder. And I've came to the realization that the reason I can get away from that guilt and I can be free today is because I've realized that God didn't put that together. James did. 
And the next one that I have that, that I'm going to grow old with, God's going to do it. James ain't going to have nothing to do with it. And so I'm just practicing today when I'm in the presence of the lady to try and have a queen and a princess because the only way that's going to be is if I treat her like one. I have a daughter that's 15 years old, and I was sharing this with a friend before you started your session. Uh, when she was nine, she taught me what to do. She told me, Daddy, if you want a friend, you have to be one. And that came from my nine-year-old, and she's 15 years old today, and I can take no credit, absolutely no credit, for where that little lady has come. She is a member of the International Honor Society. She's most popular in her class. She is admired and by everyone. And she only sees her daddy every two weeks. So her daddy hadn't had a thing in the world to do with that. And I don't really think her mom has either. This little lady has done that right by herself. And it started when she read to me rule number 10 at that same age of nine. She said, Daddy, did you see rule number 10? Did you know rule number 10 has to do with life? And I said, rule number 10 of what? She was reading the inside box cover of a game of regular checkerboard. Rule number 10 of regular checkers says this. Always pick an opponent that is better than you. And let losing make you better, not bitter. Thank you. I've got a question. I'm Ken. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I'll, God willing, have five years. Monday, my girlfriend and I got together after I had a year and a half. It's been, add that up, three and a half years. I have never been with anybody three and a half years. It's hard. It's real hard because we don't know. And um, if we should go to Al Anon, should we go to the same meeting? You know, there's all these little fine points and fine lines and and I've I've suggested she go to Al Anon a lot. But uh, uh I mean I'm really I'm an alcoholic, what can I say? Uh and uh I'm just wondering, I'm I'm thinking on strongly suggesting that we both go. I haven't made that decision yet. Or I could maybe go, huh? You know? But anyway, that, that's my question and and I've learned a lot from y'all. Well, I think it depends on the two of you. Because when I first started Alan on everything I did, I would say, don't give me that Alan on crap. This is for real. <laughs> um, and so he came to Alan on to see what was really going on. And uh, in the beginning, I was intimidated by him being there. I was afraid to say anything because he would critique what I said on the way home, and I talked too fast, and I left this out, and all this stuff. And finally, I got so that I didn't care what he said. I mean, I was going there for myself, and if he didn't like what I said, he would have to handle that. Um, I don't know, and today Paul goes to Alana with me, and I guess as a result of that, I don't have to sort out what I'm going to say. Whatever I want to say, I say. And like I say, it goes back to he has to handle it if he doesn't like it. And I think that's true with him, with me, too. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I don't know whether you would be or not, but I, it would be a good idea for both of you to go. The only other thing that I think that you should do is go as an Al-Anon, not as an alcoholic. Because I, especially newcomers are intimidated if an alcoholic comes into their they, I know how I felt. I felt that they knew a lot more than I did. I don't know why, but, I, well, maybe it was my training with Paul. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but um, they are intimidated. So if you go and you're going there because you want al so you identify yourself as a member of al -Anon. That's all. I would just like to add my point to that, too. I, I can't speak as an authority in al -Anon, but my uh, observation has been that to say that you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous at an al -Anon meeting is no more appropriate than to say that you're a member of uh, Overeaters Anonymous or Sex Anonymous or that you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Catholic or a Protestant or heterosexual or anything else. 
I mean, you go to Al-Anon as an Al-Anon newcomer and learn. That's just my opinion of the, how we should do it. And whether or not you can both go to the same meetings, I'd suggest you might try going to one together and one not together, uh, just to give each other a chance to say things you might want to say. But it's, it might be news to the alcoholics in the audience to know that in Al-Anon, they don't spend their time talking about the alcoholics. Uh, when they do mention what, what the alcoholic has done, it's to say it in terms of what that meant to them. It's not the, a lot of alcoholics go to an Al-Anon meeting and are uncomfortable because they think they're talking about them. They're not. They're talking about themselves. And so but you have to go and find out. Yes. I'm Judy, and I'm alcoholic. Hi, Judy. Um, I've been engaged for four years now, and uh, I've been sober a little, going on eight months. And my fiancé, he's been sober going on ten months. And we started out the AA program together. And uh, But as we've grown in the program, I still keep going to my meetings every night and uh, sometimes two and three times a night. And But we have a job where he does can't leave the job. We manage a motel. And one office has to be there 24 hours a day. But it seems like we, since we've been in the program, instead of growing closer together, we've grew better apart because I've been going to my meetings. And, uh, you know, we used to sit up all night and talk together and just, you know, we had a lot in common. And now it seems like, I suppose for my program, is we don't have that much in common anymore. Is that kind of normal, or do you think that that might be? Did you say um, he's going to meetings, or he isn't? Did you say he is not going to meetings? Uh, no, he's not getting. He's been to maybe two since we took over this job, but that's mainly because he won't let me be there at night. In the day, when he's usually sleeping during the day, so he doesn't get to go as much, you know. How long have you had this job, or he only goes uh, since July? Since July. But it, it seems to me that a couple that doesn't grow together grows apart. And that, in the first place, you're both in your first year, so neither one have regained your sanity yet. Mm-hmm. And so there are two people all mixed up trying to make, get something straightened out. One of them's no longer going to meetings. You'd hardly expect it to work out and at this point. And the worse than this, you're probably both exactly where you're supposed to be. But you, and, and except, I hope your focus is on primarily on your own sobriety, not on the relationship, and take care of yourself, and everything else will work out the way it's supposed to. Uh, that's the only thing I know to do. Really, and set yourself, set an example for him on how to work a good program, and he'll either follow you or he won't. And if he doesn't follow you, you're probably better off anyway. But what you you don't need if you're new in sobriety is a practicing alcoholic spouse or boyfriend would seem to me. And uh, that sounded like advice, eh? and it's not, ex- uh, I'm not sharing, so it's just it's been my experience that way. Handle it anyway you can. Take you Keep your sobriety first. How are how you doing on the steps? Um, I'm working on my sixth step. Working on your fifth? Six. 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 Mm-hmm. Good for you. Good for you. Give her a hand. My name's Beth, and I am an alcoholic, and you know, I've had so many relationships that I've carried a lot of baggage and garbage. And it's like, I'd like to have a relationship. I know I'm not ready for a relationship, and that's okay, but it's not okay. And I'm trying to get rid of the garbage and the baggage, but every time I look to someone that might be okay, that I think might look good, might have what I what I would desire in a man, I start thinking, well, it's not this, it's not that. And I start getting all this garbage and all these flags and signs that keep coming up. And I just like to think, how long are you sober? Uh, ten months, almost. Ten months? Not sober a year yet. So you no. shouldn't... Huh? No. So I kind of believe there's a lot of uh, value in that idea of not making any major decisions in the first year. Oh, I'm not making a major decision. I'm just looking. <laughs> <laughs> You're just hoping for the opportunity to make a decision. <laughs> they... they you know, and if we turn our will and our lives over the care of God, that includes our relationships, you know. we got time for one quick one, okay? I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about putting, we talk about putting principles before personality. 
in our lives. And I was able to do that work in, in the group and everything like that. And I began to do that just a little bit at home, trying to do that. I'm not real successful at it. But I wanted you to just talk about that. I, I think that a, a lot of uh, what we've been saying is that doing that and making the decision that uh, the principle is more important than the personality. And um, when I uh, when I deal with Max as a personality, my I have I was born with a certain talent, uh, and the talent is to find the fault or the defect in other people. And uh, the Bible says if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And, uh, <laughs> and so I had the biblical command to practice that. And uh, uh, but if I deal with the, the principle of being loving and acting loving and making a success of this, it works much better than if I focus on... Uh, uh, it, one of the things that uh, I think that makes my higher power the happiest is when I have a lot of self-esteem, when I really value what God has done with what I gave him to work with when I came into the program. And... Uh, I think he really smiles on that when I like me. And I think that's one of the most important things I can do is really value his workmanship. Now, if that's true for me, then it's true for other people. And so the best thing I can do for another person is to help raise their self-esteem. And if I claim that I love another person, then the best thing I can do for that person is to do whatever I can do to raise that person's self-esteem. And the interesting thing I found about that is that I can't raise somebody else's self-esteem without automatically raising my own, too. And conversely, I can't resent somebody else without resenting myself, too. So we get back what we put out. And... Uh, Trying to raise the other person's self-esteem has been a very important thing. One more thing I wanted to say was this business of trying to share feelings in red of, instead of facts is uh, difficult. I don't, I don't, I don't think of it. I remember one time, uh, Max uh, and I, she wanted to do some redecorating, and so she had ordered. Uh, she was working with this uh, interior decorator. And he was a big guy, big guy, really a big, big guy, and uh, not a very happy guy, but a big guy. And, and he sold her this uh, big wall bookcase, and they delivered it. He bought it on the sale. They had a sale, and they bought it, and uh, they, they delivered it to the house. They had a hard time getting it in because it was so big. Put it in the room. It overwhelmed the room. Far too big. It was black, black, black. We had to send it back. So I said, call him up and take him. Have him get it. No, and she said, you call him up. And I said, no, I said, you call him. You've been working with him. You know, we started fighting back and forth as to who was going to call this big guy and tell him to take this thing back. And we were really fighting about the thing. I was winning. Uh, <laughs> I, I do because I, I can shout louder. And, 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 and finally I said to her, why don't you want to call him? And she said, well, because I'm afraid of the guy. I said, afraid of him? Give me the phone. I'll call this number. But, you know, and, and once we got feeling into the matter, the battle was over. I said, Thank you all very much. I enjoyed being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.